Okay, can we start about, Anthony, how you got into being a painter? Well, I started from a very early age. I, I was always interested in art, and I think, um, to a degree, I think it was not so much that I was I felt I was good at art, but I, th I probably pretty much bad at everything else. So I found myself, <laughs> I found myself, um, you know, I'd get sort of appreciation from the work I would do in mm. art, and you know, it was a very solitary kind of uh, activity for me. And, and and in those early days, I was I was very much a solitary person. You know, I liked that kind of uh, the act of just being on your own and just creating for yourself. And so, um, you know, it really, it's, it's difficult to say why someone turns to art or why someone's creative or why someone needs to make a mark. Um, but somehow, on some level, in some way, it made sense. It felt like it was right. And it could have been well been that everything else felt wrong. And this is the one thing that didn't feel wrong. Well, so, you, you had very difficult family circumstances, as I understand. Yes, I did, yes. So, uh, I mean, this is very much informed my art. I mean, my brother was, well, he was a sort of paranoid schizophrenic, and um, from a very early age, he was very violent. Your, this is your brother? This is my brother. So I would have been eight, and he would have been 14, and this carried on for about eight years. So he was very destructive. So uh, one of the things he was destructive with is glass. He was always smashing glass. Um, windows, front door panes, televisions, uh, aquariums. I mean, one of my abiding memories is um, the aquarium. Suddenly we were all sitting there in the living room and suddenly the, uh, something, a missile or whatever, hurls through to the, the fish, fish tank facade and you have all these sort of fish flailing around in this image of, fuse, of glass and beautiful fish all fused on the floor and so there was a very uh, destructive uh, element growing up in my life. And I think this is very much informed my art now because all my art, uh, all, everything I paint, all the objects I paint, go into glass. And so I'm kind of inverting that kind of meaning of glass as a destructive emblem. And I'm kind of taking it back and reappropriating it. And, you know, no longer is it an object which destroys beauty. And I'm talking about literal beauty, the uh, physical things around us, but also a metaphorical beauty, family life, uh, my childhood, my brother's health and his childhood, mm. that kind of beauty being destroyed. Um, so now I kind of revert that and I use glass as a way of capturing beauty, of placing things in, in the glass and kind of reclaiming it and, um, uh, and using it as a vehicle to um, make sense of, of my world today. So, you are in fact a, a realist painter, but with a, a kind of surrealist overtone, is that correct? Yes, I mean, you pointed this out, Edward, and, and uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, I began very much a realist, um, and uh, I think my paintings began to broaden out a bit, and I started doing a series of paintings called Portal Paintings. And uh, this is where you know, when you think of realist work, I guess you tend to think of objects in placed in a physical environment, a very tangible, concrete physical environment, on the table or whatever a, a setting you, you generally place them. But then I began to take my objects and they began to find their own environment. And, uh, wow, that's a bright light. <laughs> and, um, and so I created these portals. There was no longer a fixed place. Um, I mean, you think of Caravaggio's, uh, the Medusa's head on the shield, and I think this is something you referred to before, uh, Edward, that if suddenly you find this, this, this head is no longer in a real space, it's kind of hovering, it uh, has its own existence, and the blood spurting from the neck is in its own space, which makes it a very unusual kind of um, representation for that the, period. What you call portals are really mm. like lenses, aren't yes, they? Yes, that's right, yes. Um, so that everything is seen under a lens, is that correct? Yes, that's right, yes. So everything floats around in this environment and this gave me more scope. Um, I mean, when you think of traditional still life, you, you, you kind of conjure up these images of flower arranging, you know? Mm. Um, well, that goes there and that goes there and you, you, you want to create this kind of a composition which makes some kind of aesthetic sense. 
or now with the portal paintings now I'm free it's like oh I'm no longer restricted to a bowl uh, I can create my environment but nevertheless you are in many respects, a very traditional painter, are you not? I mean to say, you paint with very traditional techniques. I do. My, my techniques are always traditional, and even with the portal paintings. I, I began early on doing portraiture, and I'd used a Flemish technique, or what, what I loosely refer to as a Flemish technique. I don't know the exact processes they used um, back then with Vermeer, but uh, certainly you would say it's an indirect form of painting, so you'd have a layered technique, so you'd build up from your uh, umber layers to uh, a grisaille layer and then you'd add all your glazes on top and you'd get a kind of an optical effect where the light would pass through these multiple coloured glazes through the, uh, the grisaille, through the umber layer, it'd hit the, the white gesso mm -hmm. and it would bounce back and this would give an optical effect, uh, a translucency which is beautiful for, the, for human skin. I mean it's absolutely mm -hmm. ideal and I thought well I've used that in portraiture but also you can transfer this over to to fruit, I mean, you think of fruit with its uh, like a plum with its skin, but beneath the skin is the flesh, and it's uh, in in some ways it's got the same properties as a, uh, you know, uh, you know, a young girl's blossoming, blooming face. So yeah, I've used uh, very traditional techniques, and um, I kind of come in in and out of a direct method of painting and an indirect method of painting. Oh, where did you train? I trained at Kingston. Uh, I had a dire time there. Uh, I was pretty appalling. It was a very conceptual school. Um, and uh, I was doing conceptual sculpture and, and painting and I didn't really get it. And um, basically I was kicked out of my third year for you know, general slovenly behaviour and um, you know, with good reason. And <laughs> so I, you know, I, you know, I, I you know, kind of left with my tail between my uh, legs, and I had to find my own way. I had to make my own sense, and I couldn't get my sense of, of what art meant to me in an art school. Um, so it took me years to actually find my, my make sense of you know what I'm about, and you know I had to refer back to some you know well, previous issues. Well, there are two comments here. First of all, in a way, it's a classic story of the artist rebelling against his environment, uh, but in your case it's a story of the artist rebelling against um, a vision of avant-gardism, isn't it? Yes, I mean it, it is very much that, um, mm -hmm. but you know even a stance against uh, avant-gardism, against conceptualism, is in itself a, a kind of conceptual Stance. I mean, every you know, you know, I'm a, I'm against conceptualism. You know, that that's an idea, that's a concept in itself. It's to do with well, extremes. The and long various... perspective of revolutions against <laughs> <laughs> the revolution against uh, naturalism, the revolution against conceptualism. It all goes back, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I thought, I thought, right. I, you know, I'm mm. not I'm not interested in conceptual art. I mean, mm. I've got nothing against it, and uh, there's a good mm. place for it. It's, it's intellectually stimulating, but it just wasn't for me. And I thought, well, I'll go back to the humblest things you can find. It has to be something in nature. So I went back to the simplest fruit. This is, you know, this, people might find this laughable that you're going to paint fruit. But I thought, well, why not? It's, it's simple, it's honest, and it's nature. Mm -hmm. So I returned to that. And I soon be, you know, began to wonder, you know, why? And that's where the glass came in and, and the psychological element came in with, you know, my brother and his destructive mm -hmm. uh, nature with glass. And so I found myself painting with a cons you know, strong conceptual underpinning in many regards. So there's a, you know, there's a strange dichotomy there. And I, I, but you had a, I mean to say, you took it, it took you some time to find yourself. Uh, what did you do in the intervening period um, uh, after you were thrown out of, of art school or left art school yeah. and before you found your way as a painter? Well, first I did the t traditional thing when you get thrown out of art school, which is travel. So I went around six, uh, six months travelling around India and, um, you know, in a complete daze really, you know, thinking, what do I do now? You know, everything that I, I thought I understood was no longer there. And so when I came back I had to reappraise things and uh, I would say I was, for many years I was out in the hinterland. I didn't know what to do, where to go or, or, or anything. Um, I couldn't make sense of anything and I had, you know, many issues which referred back to my, you know, my brother. and. Um, I began to do a lot of graphic design, essentially, to make bread and butter. That's mm -hmm. how I made my money. I became a graphic designer, self-taught graphic designer. I worked in magazines and um, various other mm -hmm. 
you know, design projects. And, uh, and then I turned my hand to photography. I thought, I'll, I'll become a photographer. That didn't quite work out. And uh, then I, you know, I, I wrote three attempts at novels, uh, all of which were rejected. And um, so that didn't quite work out. And I thought, you know, hold on, I, lo you know, I lost something which really meant something to me at art school. You know, I was kicked out okay, but I, I allowed something to be taken away from me. Or I allowed myself to believe that something had been taken away from me. But I had to re-find it. I had to relearn that art belongs to me. It's not, it doesn't belong to an art school or anyone else. And you don't need anyone else to say, you know, you can do art or you're a good artist or you're a bad artist. Just, you, just, you can just do it. And so it took me 20 years to, to reconnect and find my love and find my passion for art. So there was a long period where I didn't have a clue what I was doing, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, we've talked about how you came to be what you are. Um, what's your vision of the future? What's your idea of where you might go? Well, um, I see a future without fruit. <laughs> <laughs> I see a future without fruit. Well, you know, you, you always return to where, you, you know, perhaps where you began, I don't know. But uh, I suddenly have, see, uh, I have an idea of these big portal paintings and I see these with nudes in them, uh, female forms inside these big portals. Essentially, I put things in which I find beautiful. So, you know, of course, I find the female form beautiful. Um, but I'm also aware that you know, this is, is you know, how do you how do you go about um, portraying or representing the female form? It's been done for thousands of years by thousands of artists, and you know, what can I do? And I began to think about, I, you know, I th thought about my fruit and how I referred back to my kind of childhood to make sense of where to go with it. And similarly with the news, I refer back to my childhood. So my, my perceptions of the female form are very mixed as a, as a young man. And it suddenly, it, you know, when I was thinking about these portals and the nude woman, I was beginning to think, well, um, you know, I, I haven't got a fixed image of male and female sex. It's, it's suddenly I've got this kind of morphed, fused image. It kind of melts between the two. And uh, so when I paint the female form, in my back of my head, this is like this third kind of androgynous figure hovering between the two. And somehow I'm going to try and reflect that in, in the work. With, there's going to be some distortions with the female form. And uh, this will make some reference to my, um, you know, my strange distorted perception of male and female sexes. Well, you have a partly Indian background, don't you? That's correct, yeah. Um, and do you think this has something to do with what one sees in some classical forms of Indian art, both uh, Indian sculpture, um, where male forms are often extremely sinuous and female? Yes, yes. I mean, I very much uh, came across the Hijra uh, community in India, but um, I think also in Michelangelo, where you see a, a strange kind of sense of androgyny, um, it may be something to do with the fact that he had limited access to female models. It may be the fact that he was homosexual and he, he, he regarded the, the male form was more of an ideal than the female form. But where you see instances of the female form, you see a kind of a man's, a maleness incorporated into these female bodies. So there's this, but you think of David, it's got a very feminine quality, the statue of David, but it's absolutely beautiful. So where you get that com combination for me, mm then, for me, you're getting an ideal beauty. So there are lots of echoes in your work. Uh, that, 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 that For you, the art of the past is a kind of echo chamber. Uh, but it produces, like echo chambers do, new sounds. That is, it doesn't simply reflect to you, back to you the sound which is made, the echo chamber, but it makes a new sound from the one you throw at it. Yes, I, you know, I, I, exactly. I mean, you... Um you want to make sense of mm. what you're doing, mm. and you refer back, and you use, um, you know, that which has been done, in a sense, to to give your work some kind of underpinning, some kind of way of making sense of it. And uh, I, you know, I find with Michelangelo, there is a there is a, a great sense there for me in his work. So you're not an appropriationist in the modern sense. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not. I'm not that kind of appropriationist. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, well, I'll, I'll allow you and uh, another <laughs> eminent historians to judge that uh, for me. Okay, I'm sure we will. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Mm -hmm.